Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and in today's episode, we're heading north for cross country skiing under the Aurora Borealis, sailing amongst the Baltic Islands, and silence amongst the Finnish forests, as I talk to author Helena Halmer about her home country. So I worked in Helsinki one summer in my 20s. The nights were bright, and we drank vodka in the sauna and then jumped in the Baltic to cool off. And of course, we pronounce that sauna in English, but Helena uh, describes how important it is to say the word sauna uh, for the Finns. So I remember how musical the Finnish language sounded in the dusk of the midnight sun. And I always intended to go back because I had such a great time. But that was the late 1990s and I haven't returned to Finland. So it was wonderful to talk to Helena about the things she loves about the place. We talk about the introvert nature of the Finnish people, why the landscape might be the key to happiness, the unusual Åland Islands and how Finland's history of occupation still shapes the country today. Plus Helena's view of the English as an expat, which made me laugh because it's so true. And sometimes it takes an outsider to really pinpoint what makes a national identity. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Helena Holm is the award-winning author of Contemporary Nordic Romance with a Hint of Noir. Originally from Finland, she now lives in the UK. Welcome to the show, Helena. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Now, I want to start with this hilarious thing, right? So according to the World Happiness Report, uh, for the last two years, Finland is the happiest country in the world. So I, I want you to start with, like, tell us some, some why is that? Like, what are, what are the well, amazing things? <laughs> you tell me. Um, it's actually, uh, it always makes me laugh as well, because Finns are very, they're really miserable. <laughs> it's you know, if you go to Finland and you don't know anybody, um, they are really hard to get to know. But once you do know them, somebody told me that Finns are like puppies, that once they get to know you, they'll never leave you, your, your side. So, But Finns are incredibly, um, yeah, they're really private people. They are very outdoorsy. They love the forest. I mean, 65% of the country is covered by forest. Um, and they like being on their own. I mean, there is a really successful uh, set of um, uh, modern modern uh, books called The Finnish Nightmares. And it's all about, it's this character, I can't remember his name, Matti, that's it. And there's this character and it's, it's drawings about, you know, situations that most people really in the Western world at least find sort of a little bit painful like if you live in this in a block of flats and and somebody who lives opposite you opens the door at the same time you don't really want to see them or if somebody sits next to you on the bus and it's full of these sort of awkward moments that Finns really find difficult because they're so used to not really having many people around so I don't know why they're happy I well obviously they are <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting like you mentioned there's 65 percent forest of, of yeah. the country so I mean maybe that's got something to do with it. It's like time spent in nature is one of the things we are all encouraged to do to be happy, right? Yes, and indeed, I mean, joking aside, it is a wonderful lifestyle. I mean, they have very short working hours. Um, They seem to be very efficient at what they do, even though they work work very short days. They have long holidays, um, three or four weeks in the summer. It's not unusual. Um, And they, they seem to have sort of got the balance of working and leisure time sorted. Their schools are excellent. Childcare is excellent. 
Um, so, you know, I don't know why I left. <laughs> yeah, now you're talking yourself back into it. So I, 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 I do want to, I mean, I did spend one summer in Helsinki and I'm so glad it was, it was a summer. I mean, it was light yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, it was, I had a great summer and I was in my twenties. Uh, so I enjoyed some, uh, some vodka and yeah. I, but I remember being quite shocked uh, and the people were actually wonderful and friendly and just lovely, but I was quite shocked by one of the communal saunas, uh, of yeah. which people I actually worked with were naked kid in the sauna so I want to ask you about about the sauna what what part does that play in Finnish culture well uh, it, it is it is a complete contradiction I think the country is a contradiction because we're very private people but then we take our clothes off in front of other people so I mean something that people are just not as body conscious um it's it I I can't really explain it but I mean it sounds as well, invent, invented, I guess, but there's, it's a cultural thing that that Finns had to have somewhere to wash themselves, and they would they lived in a hut, and they just put one, you know, stove at the one corner, and then then started washing themselves around that, and that's how saunas really, you know, became the modern thing that they are. But um, it's a it's a it's a quite it's a disarming thing because. In the sauna, everybody's naked, and you really don't know who's the boss and who's, you know, who's the employee. Everybody, and it's not a sexual thing. I have to emphasize yes. that, as you probably found out, it's nothing to do with sex. Um, and in fact, a human body naked is very unsexual thing. You know, it's it's actually what you put to hide the bits that makes it sexy. So it's it, it's it's a strange thing, but it's it's a really, I mean, that is really what I would. If I somebody said what's the best known and what do you think is is, is the thing that describes Finland best, I would probably say forest and a sauna, and the lakes. You know, it's just it is those things that to me mean Finland, and I I, I wish I could explain it <laughs> more, but I, it's just one of those quirky things. Yes, it it is quirky because it's so funny. Like uh, almost you're dis- describing an introvert culture, yeah. and yet for many people, I mean, Finland is is a Western culture but the uh concept of taking your clothes off i mean i find i mean uh german germany was the other place i went to where yeah. in the uh, swimming you know uh, in parks and things like there's much more comfort with nudity but in in the yeah. uk and in america the americans listening will be like what this this just sounds kind of scary but it, it's not scary is it, it you know no, and and, and also all. just as a visitor i did wear a swimming costume so is that okay um yeah <laughs> No, no. <laughs> well, they will go foreigner. You yes. Know. I mean, it, I, it's and it's, it's not a bad thing. I mean, people do, but yeah, it's it's a sort of a. As I said, it's 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 an it's almost an equalizer. So everybody's equal in a sauna. So, you know, that's that's what it's about, really. It's and and people really do not look at each other's bodies. Uh, it's just. Yeah, I it, it's a really I love it. Of course, that's one thing that I really miss about Finland is the sauna. Because also the the cleansiness. You know, the, when you step out of a sauna and if you don't wear a swimming costume, you you are so clean. Mm. It, it just cleanses the whole of your body. And I really miss that wonderful feeling that you know, especially if you can then swim in the lake afterwards. It is just nothing like you can't get that sense doing anything else. It's fantastic. Right. So that is going to be the first tip, like brave, yeah. brave the sauna and Absolutely. go for it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the pronunciation as well. I have tried over my 35 years here to educate the whole of the UK that it's pronounced sauna, not sauna. But, you know, it's a long way to go. <laughs> it, it is. No. That, OK, so that's brilliant. So you also mentioned the lakes. So tell us yes. about, about the lakes. Well, the lakes, there are what there are about 200,000 lakes in Finland. And when you think about that, it's a country the same size as the UK, roughly. That covers a lot of the, the landmass as well. So you have 65% of forest and then, I don't know, 30% lakes. So there isn't an awful lot of land left. Um, and lakes really were, were formed in the Ice Age, very much like the Lake District here. And in fact, fin- Finnish lakes are very similar to the lake district in the UK, except that there are grander, the lake district is, you know, the, the lakes are deeper and there, is, there's, there are mountains where it's, Finland is fairly flat. Um, and they are really most people, um, I think something like 75% of people have a cottage by a lake. 
and they go there in the summer, they go there for Christmas, and that, I suppose, and they obviously have a sauna. Um, and that sort of, I guess, that alone or family time, it may be the reason why Finland is so happy as well, because they do sort of prioritize outdoor activities time with your family or time alone. So it sort of centers them and then they go into the busy life of work. So I think that's really also part of that the, the sort of the Finnish happiness <laughs> equation. Mm, yeah, getting away to the, this is, mm. this just sounds amazing. Like what do you yes. do? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I leave? <laughs> yes, we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to, it, to, to that. But um, you did mention the land is flat. So I, uh, the people I talked to, you know, many did cross country skiing. Like that does seem yeah. to be quite a normal thing. It um, is, yeah. And that's something that I think, again, like a lot of British people, um, you know, when we say skiing, we mean downhill skiing. Yes. So yeah. what, like what what is cr- cross country skiing? Like explain it a bit, because it is quite different, isn't it? It's very different. Well, it's it's basically the skis are much narrower. I think they're about a third of the the, the downhill skis, and they're much longer. So they they're sort of slightly shorter than you yourself are. So they're much much longer than the, than the downhill skis, and you really literally have to push and glide. So it's a flat skiing. So you ski forward and you push yourself with your poles and you glide with one foot after another. Now, to me, it comes naturally. But when I took my husband, the, the original Englishman, when I took him skiing, cross country skiing the first time, he kept falling backwards because, of course, in in downhill skiing, that's the thing you sort of, re, you know, rest on your on your uh, shoes, on your um, mm. boots. But when you cross country ski, you you just have literally like trainers, but they you know they're sort of attached to the skis, and so you can't you can't rest backwards on your on your boots, and so he get fell, falling backwards. <laughs> so it's more like walking. For everybody above himself. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually it is more like a walking action than a like uh-huh. a skiing action. Yeah, if you ever, if you ever go on a cross trainer, it's a bit like that. Mm. Even though you go up, but you you know you literally just have to push yourself. It's gliding and gliding with one foot and then lifting the other. Other, um, I'm trying to think how I do it now. You lift uh, lift the uh, other foot a little bit and then yeah, it's and like, then glide. like yeah. And are there um uh, are there trails and guides yeah. and pl- yeah. specific places that people can can go to do that? They are, yeah, everywhere. Um, you know, in in cities, um, whenever it snows, they they uh, they have trails, and even in in Helsinki, they have an indoor arena where you can you can go around in a in a, in a sort of a cross country trail. Yeah, and they're lit at night, so because of course in the winter, especially in Lapland, there is no sunshine for what is it two three months three mm, months. Yeah. And so all the all the um, trails are lit, so you can. It, and it's wonderful, actually. It's really, really wonderful. I, I when I go to Lapland, I always really cross country ski more than downhill. Now it's it's just, and it's hard. Yes, it's I've hard. heard that. It's very. Uh, it's good for fitness, isn't it? It's very. It's the best thing for fitness. And also, when you go downhill, because there are you know a few downhills, uh, it's quite scary because you have to keep to the tracks. And mm. so it's exactly the opposite of downhill skiing. So you have to sort of lean away from the from the curve rather than into it. You know, when you go downhill skiing, you have to you have to lean into the mountain. Yes, yeah. you do exactly opposite almost. So it's it, it is quite difficult to learn. But and I, in fact, for me now, I've I have done it for years and years. Obviously, I I was nearly born with skins on my in my feet, but it's still difficult now because I don't do it you know, every day in the, in, in the winter or mm. you know, a couple of times in the winter. Yeah. And yeah. so you mentioned that going to Lapland and that, yeah. it just, that just sounds so romantic to people, <laughs> especially like we're recording this in the run up to Christmas, like Lapland and Christmas. Um, so t- tell us about Lapland. Oh, Lapland is wonderful. Um, it's, it's uh, the best thing to do in Lapland is obviously to see Father Christmas because there's in near Rovaniemi there is something called Santa Claus Land, and it is very commercial. But at the same time, you get to see Father Christmas, and he can be quite, uh, uh, quite Finnish. <laughs> in that, you know, he told me once when I went there with my children, I was speaking English to them at this point. I can't remember why. He told me off for not speaking Finnish to my kids, and I thought. 
Well, uh, hello. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but he's, you know, he's a real brilliant person. He's, he's, it's, he can be very funny as well. So, um, and then there is, you can take rides on reindeer, you know, on, on, on sledges pulled by reindeer. Um, and there is snow, 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 snow. There's so much snow. Um, and there can be northern lights if you're lucky. Mm. Uh, it is just, it's wonderful. Even though it's dark, because there's snow on the ground, um, it sort of, because during the day there's a little bit of light, it sort of tends to reflect that. And then, then even though it's dark, it still sort of isn't that dark because of the snow. So, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And there's silence. That's the other thing about Finland. There's silence. You don't get silence in the UK anywhere, really. There's <laughs> silence in Finland. Yes, it, it, silence is fantastic. Um, so just the opposite end of the scale, I think, to Lapland is your recent book, The Island Affair, is set yes. in the, is it Arland Islands? Yes, Arland yes. Islands. Yes, so tell us, uh, why are they so special and why, you know, why did they inspire you to write? Well, I, I've been going to the Orland Islands for the last 20 years in the summer. My, my mother is married to an Orlanding, um, a guy who, who was born in the same house where he still lives. And these are sort of quirky, a little bit like the Channel Islands, but they are a little bit more quirky in that, I suppose the same, they belong to or they are part, self-governing part of Finland, but they are Swedish speaking. So you have to speak Swedish in order to settle there. You're not allowed to settle un unless you pass a Swedish speaking test. Um, and there are very few people living there. I think it's about 30,000, but they, they rely on tourism. So they're, because they're a tax free, uh, set of islands, they rely on really tourism from Finland and Sweden. And in the summer, the number of people there triples. So it's a very sort of, it, again, this contradiction thing. That it's an island of contradictions. It's beautiful. The archipelago is just stunning. There are um, thousands and thousands of islands. Most of them are unoccupied, tiny, tiny outcrops. And then, but, but at the same time, it's, and they're very independent, but they're very dependent on Finland and Sweden for tourism. Mm. And then, and they're more Swedish than they're Finnish, but they belong to Finland. And so, so it's, it's sort of this sort of quirkiness of independence and dependence. And I just love that kind of contradiction again. And it's, that's why I said the book's there, really, because um, I just wanted to bring that to people. I want to describe that sort of strange place to people. And I hope I have. Mm. So just give us an idea of, of what they look like, because when people say an island affair, in many people's minds, they're seeing white sand and palm trees. But, you know, what what, what do they kind of look like? What's the feeling there? Well, it, there are the stony, craggy islands. So, it's, you know, there are there are beaches, really. There are a couple of beaches. But um, how shall I describe them? Um, pines, um, mm. rocks, um, the island itself, the, the main island, it's it has a city and it's sort of it's very very nordic in in the, in in the winter there's there's snow and 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 there are christmas markets and candles outside and you know and 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 lights strung onto trees and stuff like that and in the summer it, it's just a summer island uh it's difficult to describe but it's, it's sort of a nordic summer island so it does get quite warm in the summer but not necessarily so um and people just come there to party and to go and, and stay in their tiny cottages by the sea, swim, have a sauna. It's a sort of a, a holiday island from that point of view. To me, that's normal holiday island. Yeah. <laughs> I know most people, it isn't, you know. Oh, no, but I personally, I prefer, st I, I don't like sand beaches. So I much prefer a, a stone beach with the sea yeah. and things like that. So I, I get that. But I just wanted to let people know because, you know, it, it, it's hard because it's such a diverse country, right? Yes, it you know, is. Like Lapland versus the islands versus, you know, Helsinki. These are very different places. They are, yes, yeah, it is, and and the I mean everybody has a jetty. It's actually sailing is one of the things that people mostly do there because of the archipelago. So there's a archipelago which you can actually take um, if you if you're driving, you can take ferries from the small islands all the way from Finland to the Orland Islands, and you don't have to take the larger ferries which stop there, you know, on their way to Finland and Sweden, but um, so people sail a lot from Finland to the Orland Islands in the summer. Because it's just so easy to you know to 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 stop at any island and and just uh, put the um, 
oh, what is it called? Ah, what do you put down? The anchor? Oh, you know what I mean. Anchor. <laughs> anchor, that's it. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. well, since, since you, I mean, because obviously, um, ev- well, I found that everyone in Finland that I met speaks English, you know, yes. as well yeah. as you do. So what is the, um, does everyone speak English or is that just a sort of function of the Finns I might have met? I, most people do. Um, it's um, especially in, in, in the sort of in the southern parts in Helsinki, where I'm from in Tampere, it's a little bit rarer. But really, especially now with the Internet and the TV, um, it, it's because Finnish is such a difficult language to learn. It's the third. It's been said that it's the third most difficult language to learn. But um, so people do tend to they know that if they have to go beyond the borders and there's only five billion of us. They're going to have to speak another language. So, so we are at the schools. Uh, in schools, particularly, um, it's very much orientated towards learning la- other languages. So, when I was at school, I learned English where at, from the age of seven. Um, then I learned Swedish from the age of um, eleven, and then German and French. So I speak four languages, and that's not unusual. Mm, which is fantastic. Which is fantastic. So let's um, let's just talk a bit about the history because the other thing um, when I I was there, people would talk about the Russian influence, and of course mm. you've mentioned Sweden there. So what are some of the historical aspects that still impact the country today? Well, um, when we were first under Swedish uh, rule for a long, long time, so and then in um, in at the end of this the 19th century um sweden lost finland in a war to russia so we were a grand duchy of russia for 100 years until 1917 when we when we gained our independence from lenin and um so the russian influence is obviously quite strong still um and particularly culturally i mean food is you know, we pickle everything and, uh, you know, beetroot and cucumbers and mushrooms. And, and we eat a lot of sort of rice filled pastries and, and very heavy meat stews and stuff like that. Um, or oh, those are the traditional foods. People don't re- you know, eat them as much anymore, but those are the traditional foods. Um, and then there is this sort of, because we then had a war, two wars against um, Soviet Union, which it was then during the Second World War. Uh, because they they want to invade us and we we didn't want that so we had a war so we won which is quite you know quite good and then we had to um, ask Germans for help which was a bit of a mistake during the Second World War um, but so Finland has this sort of hate really relationship with Russia even now I mean even now when um, Putin is sort of trying to assert his influence and constantly flying planes um, in our uh, airspace mm. um and there is this talk that um he's been buying up strategic li- islands in the archipelago so that if because if uh, Orland is that's another contradiction about the country that it is in a very strategic position in in the baltic because if that landmass was to be invaded then you could actually have very good access to quite a few countries around the baltic mm. um so you know, there's sort of these stories and, and conspiracy theories. And so we have a sort of a real hate relationship with Russia. On the other hand, with Sweden, we have a love-hate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> we love them because they're so good at everything. You know, just look at ABBA and, and, uh, and uh, you know, there are so many Volvo and, you know, there are so many good things about Sweden, but they are so arrogant. <laughs> so, <laughs> We think they are incredibly arrogant. So they're like an elder brother, you know, who you, you love to hate. So, um, yeah, so that's the sort of the, the Russian and the, I mean, Russians, obviously, we, you know, you are, we are a small country. We're a tiny, tiny country next to a massive superpower. Mm. So, you know, we're bound to hate them. But during the Cold War, we were literally just bal- a balancing act and, how Finland managed not to get invaded, I really don't know. I mean, it was it was quite a balancing act to to to, to have to do that. And uh, um, I mean, now there are coming out all sorts of stories about how that was done. But yeah, it's scary stuff. Yeah, and I think 
it's so interesting because I, you know, and I'm glad you've explained it because when I was there, I was like, why do these people really hate Russia? <laughs> and, and it's it's so, but it's so interesting because we often think of countries as this kind of self-contained environment. Um, yeah. But actually, you know, as you say, with the borders, I mean, here in the UK, of course, you know, <laughs> well, uh, we're still going through uh, Brexit uh, discussions, but the yes. border issue and when you have sea around, I mean, yes. obviously we have the border with, with Ireland, but, yeah. you know, borders are very different when your country is kind of sandwiched in the middle of of things as you say right next to a, a big superpower absolutely and I remember when I was a child um because we traveled around Finland a lot my father believed that you couldn't you shouldn't go abroad if you hadn't you know if you don't know your own own country so we went everywhere every summer camping which I still hate um <laughs> and so on the border you know you could occasionally they would have sort of you knew you could see the border, which was just this strip of land, which is stripped of, or, or stripped of trees. And on the other side, there would be a gentry, you know, up a, a tower and with machine guns. And I remember seeing it and I remember thinking and the parents were like, no, 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 don't go don't, 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 don't close, you know, because you just knew that if he shot anyone on the border on the Finnish side, nothing would happen. Nobody would take it up. Mm. And you just knew that we were you know, we were vulnerable. And also, you know, you at school, you weren't allowed to use the word Russian. You have to use a Soviet, you know, they were Soviets, not Russians. Mm. And you weren't allowed to talk badly about Russians. Um, and it just, I don't think that's not the case anymore, but certainly not since the, you know, the dissolvement of, of Soviet Union. But it, it was a real threat, you know, you were really, you knew that you had to be careful. And I've actually, written a book about that era because it kept sort of coming back to me. And, and so I, I wrote a book about set in the Cold War about a, a school girl who, you know, gets gets involved in with the KGB and stuff because it's so interesting, uh, such an mm. interesting time. Mm. Oh, just tell us the title of that book. It's called The Red King of Helsinki. Fantastic. OK, so talking of the darker side, I mean, one of the uh, things that has become, I guess, in the last sort of 10 years is this obsession with Nordic noir, yes. and um, which which is this darker side of that whole area, I guess. So what, what, why is this so, so popular? I think I think it's it's got to do with the fact that the image of the Nordic countries and Finland and Sweden in particular um, and Denmark, I suppose, well, all of them, uh, is that it's a very well organized, a very happy place. It's, you know, it's it's full of sort of rational people um, just working and, you know, doing their own thing. And then when you, you have these dark forces and dark deeds and, you know, people being tied up with, with tape in a chair and, you know, these sort of things that it's such a contrast to that happy place that I think it sort of appeals to people and and I think somebody said that particularly in the UK is so so very popular because it's quite close to British culture but it's different mm. so it's it's very easy for the Brits particularly to you know to to identify themselves in these people these Nordic people who are very similar to them but different and I think that's that's really it yeah and i mean obviously i mean i i well uh, it's difficult because this is a, a audio only show but people don't look different like finns don't look any different no, really to british no. people right no it, but i can tell a finn a oh, mile can away you? yeah i don't know why i've asked myself lots of times but i can always tell a finn <laughs> before they even speak yep how interesting <laughs> well, i know Let's talk about that because you are, um, it's so interesting. Your language has actually changed in this interview. At the beginning, yes, at the beginning, you started to say they, you would say they do this, they do this. And then to, uh, you, since you've warmed up, you've started to say <laughs> are and we, and you know, so you've, you've almost kind of reclaimed your, your finness, finishness. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. but tell us, like, you know, because obviously, you know, so you are a Finnish expat living in the UK yes. and you've lived here yes. a long time, I think, you know. So yeah. what, what what do you notice particularly about the difference be between the cultures? Well, it is the silence, I think, is the first thing. Um, uh, you can't, I mean, I live in London, you can't find silence. And also not just the silence of the forest. Um, I mean, there's a lovely forest next to us, Queen's Wood. But 
it's not silent. There's always aeroplanes going or you can hear the traffic or whatever. But it's not just that because, you, of course, you can go in, in places in the UK, you can go and find silence. But it's, it's, it's the silence between people. It's incredibly difficult to sit next to somebody you know in the UK and not say a word. That comfortable silence that you have around people, mm. people just don't have it. And I do miss that because now I'm spoiled. I'm completely, you know, corrupted. So I can't, when I go to Finland, I talk all the time and they sort of go, it's a very strange person. <laughs> the same, right language, the right accent, but you know she's strange. So it, it, it's that that I miss, and and things like I'd rather watch an ice hockey match than a football match. Um, I'd rather go to the woods than a park. Um, I'd rather eat, eat eat rye bread than than you know when I came over the over to the UK, there was only sliced white, and so I had to I had to actually. Oh, you know, but I do all, all the, the worst thing possible and eat Russian bread because <laughs> <laughs> they had Russian rye. And I went, oh, God, you know, at last I get because it's quite sour and dense and uh, mm. you just couldn't get that. Yeah, well, you can't get it now, actually. Russian bread is as close as still to Finnish bread. But yeah, it's those things. It's just and simplicity, simplicity of language, of speaking to people. I mean, in, in the UK, People say things that they don't mean. And to a Finn, that's really difficult because they say, oh, we must get together. And you think they mean we must get together. And a Finn thinks, oh, that's nice. <laughs> He's actually demanding or she's demanding that we get together. <laughs> and it took me years to realize that what they're saying is, please leave now and don't contact me ever again. <laughs> so, you know, it's just sort of a, you know, it's just, it's a really difficult. And I guess that now thinking back, was the thing that really sort of unsettled me in the first years that I was here because I didn't, even though I understood what they say, I didn't understand them. And so that that took a long time to get used to. Wow, that's that's so insightful. And that, that really <laughs> is, um, British people do that. And I wonder if yeah. pe people listening, I, I don't know if, Amer I don't think Americans do that. I don't know. I, I, I struggle, like the American way of like, have a nice day. I like in England, People don't say that, but if no. they said it, they wouldn't mean it. <laughs> no, I know. And I, I often wonder because I, it's sort of a, yeah, I, I often wonder that too, because particularly I think it depends on the US where you are because there's such differences between states, aren't mm. there? You know, if you're in New York, I think you're a bit more uh, sceptical, I suppose, and in a, a soul pick, but, you know. Um, but it's the, it's also the sort of the sarcasm that I, is so cutting. I mean, I'm used to it now, but I, I was thinking, oh my God, it was like a personal insult. You know, what have I done to you? And it just is that it really takes a long time to get used to it. Um, but as I say, I've, I'm corrupted now. So, I, so, so you I, get I'd it, but it's, to... it's always so interesting to hear an insight into your own culture. And then you kind of realize, um, what it is. And I think as an expat mm. for so long, you have an insight into both cultures. So just on food, you mentioned the kind of, kind of sour rye bread, that kind of dark yeah. bread of people listening. It's that kind of yeah. almost black, um, yes. quite yes. thin and dense. So you only need a small, yeah. a small piece. Um, obviously we've talked about pickling and actually pickled herring and stuff. It's, it's tasty. It's very healthy. Yeah. Um, um, what anything else uh, that people might uh, eat or drink or, or give a try at least? Well, licorice is a, another sort of a, a quirky, strange thing that we love in Finland, um, and people actually have withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> They're addicted <laughs> to licorice. It's yeah, it's it, but it's salty licorice. It's sort of a very bitter again, and and there is you know talking about vodka. There's 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 a licorice vodka that tastes just like sweets would taste deadly oh. never have it because you think oh well that's not very strong and it's very strong um uh, but and and i suppose there are sort of things like fish and meat pork pie and it's sort of again a rye crust on it and it's cooked in the oven for a very very long time and it's got sprats you know rather than Mm. So, so like little herrings. So they, they're almost like baby herrings. And it, it sounds not nice, but it's delicious. Um, and then there are Karelian pies, which are really my favorite and our family's favorite, which is again, rye, rye sort of, um, dough. And, um, uh, there's, um, rice pudding, if you like, inside and you cook them in the oven and, um, 
and you have have it with butter and and egg and and it's it's just delicious. But you know these are the things that when you tell people about them, they go, "That's no, all right. Oh, you know, that's fine. I don't need to taste that." But if you go to Finland, you must taste these things because they are just so delicious. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I remember enjoying the food very much. Um, and I but I think the and I, and I actually think now with the kind of rise of sourdough and more artisan bread, the taste for the slightly sour it has is coming back into yes. into the cuisine. Yeah, I think so. And I, and it is um, I mean, we also eat a, eat a lot of um, um, sort of bis- not biscuits, but um what they call it, sort sort of cheese biscuits, but they're sort like of like crackers. white crackers. Yes. Yeah. So um, I suppose that's the way to start, if you like. But it is the same kind of it's the same bread, but it's just been dried out. Um, mm. But it, it it is yeah, and it's very healthy. You, and you you can't eat very much of it, which is another good thing. You have a slice of rye bread, and you and that's you it. Yeah, it. it's very dense. Yeah. Yeah, I'll keep you going for a whole day of cross country skiing. <laughs> it does, yes. yes. <laughs> so, so apart from your own books, what are a few books that you would recommend uh, about Finland or set in Finland? Um, well, the first one is quite a classic. I I really really like this book, and I, it's also been made into into a film, and it's called The Year of the Hare by Arto Pasilinna, and it's um, it's a story of a of a reporter a city dweller who who nearly runs over a hare in the countryside he's you know chasing a story with his uh, cameraman and he decides to to save this hare who's sort of bleeding and just you know have, has a has a, a little wound so he decides to look after it and just disappears into the woods and the cameraman is there going what the what happened so this guy then starts having adventures he's going literally walking up north um and through the woods and sometimes something gives him a lift and and it's about really how he wants to find that silence and those forests and you know going back to his roots if you like mm. and and leaving the rat race behind and that was that was written in the 70s and but it's still really true today and it's definitely if you want to find out about the Finnish psyche that's the book to read. Uh, there are, I'm just trying to find my list because I did write these down. Um, then there's another one, which is quite a, a fairly modern one. It came out about, I think it's about 10 years ago. Um, it's called Purge, and it's by a, quite a famous Finnish-Estonian writer It's called Sophie Oksanen. Um, and it's a book, it's a Nordic noir thriller, really, but it's set in Estonia, and it's set in during, the world, during World War II and today, and it carries a really serious message about people trafficking and about, you know, how politics can really affect the small person. Mm. And it, it's incredibly, I mean, it, the name shouldn't put you off because it's, it, though it's dark, it's, it's also a thriller. So it's very fast moving, but it's, it's an incredibly good book. It's won, I mean, it's international bestseller and it's won all sorts of uh, international awards. Um, and there's another one, which I just literally finished reading. And there's a guy called Antti Tuomainen who's written really dark Nordic noir set in Finland. But he started writing these sort of little bit mash up books, a little bit like Fargo mm. sort of. Cohen Brothers kind of books and the latest one is called Little Siberia and it's set in a small village in north uh, eastern Finland where a, a meteorite has just landed on through somebody's car and so it's quite um, worth a million euros and this priest this small country priest has been sort of um, is in charge of keeping it safe and you can imagine what happens. So it's a quite a fast moving again. So it's a bit of thriller and it's sort of also about, you know, because he's obviously um, he's searching himself um, quite a lot. So it's 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 quite a lot about um, what, you know, what about ethics and what you should do and what you shouldn't do and about love and betrayal. And, you know, it's it's a really brilliant book. Mm. So I can go on. I've got lots of books. If you want me to go on. Ah, no, I think uh, three is good. I think. Okay. Uh, yes. And of course, um, your own books, we've mentioned a couple of them. And, uh, you know, you uh, are all your books set um, in Finland? Yes, they are Finland and Sweden um, and the UK. You know, my, my series is called The Nordic Heart. It starts in Finland and then it sort of goes to 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 the UK and Scotland and then 
Sweden and you know so it's all sort of that sort of area but but they're all at least they have a Finnish character in them. Yes, absolutely. So uh, last question. So this is interesting because, of course, you don't live in your home country and you call Britain home, I I guess. So what does, um, but I guess you have to, I'm in a cross-cultural marriage too, and a lot of travel means going back to the other person's country, right? Yes. Um, Which for us is New Zealand. So you've got at least a cheaper, (laughs) a a cheaper trip. But um, so what, what does travel mean to you and how does it help your writing? Well, um, I I think that if I didn't travel, I think I'd write less uh, because every time I travel, I have an idea. So everywhere I go, I always have a book set there. You know, I have book sets everywhere because it just inspires me. I don't know if it inspires you, but it it, it has a, I, I don't quite know what it is. As soon as I'm, I'm on the aeroplane, I'm thinking, oh, that's a good idea. You know, so um, either I sort of sort out a problem with the plot that I'm writing at the moment, or, or I find out new plots and new ideas. So, yeah, no, it's inspirational, hugely inspirational. Even going home, it's hugely ins- inspirational. Mm, fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? Well, probably best place is my website, which very simply is helenahalme.com. And that's H- H-E-L-E-N-A-H-A-L-M-E.com. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, where else, Pinterest, and all of those places I'm also as Helena Halmes, so I'm fairly easy to find, I hope. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Helena. That was great. My pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.